In America today, somewhere between 50 and 60% of Americans admit to self-silencing. As a country, we are not being honest with each other about what we think. And we all end up veering off paths of fulfillment and flourishing, chasing what we think other people think. If I think everybody else is happy, it's never gonna change. In today's landscape, a growing chorus of dissatisfaction echoes through every corner of society. The principles of major industries like government, education, and the workforce are being questioned. Are these systems broken? And if so, what do people want things like education and work to look like? We're kind of done being told what to do, and you're seeing a, a craving for something better. My guest today is Todd Rose, an author, professor, and social entrepreneur. And he argues that approaches to education and work that seek to control and create conformity prohibit individuals from flourishing. I don't think people right now want work to be the end all be all. They don't need work to be the thing that gives them purpose, but they are starting to expect that work play a positive role in the broader lives that they wanna live. Later, we'll visit Morningstar Tomatoes, a company whose mission-focused self-management system means there are no bosses, there's less rigid hierarchy, and it's a place where employees are empowered to be their own managers. Stay tuned as we uncover the repercussions of false consensus, the constraints within existing institutions, and the potential significance of increasing individual autonomy. The only way to solve our biggest problems is to have the audacity to try. Welcome to In the Arena with Evan Baer. Todd, really excited to dive into this conversation today. We are gonna cover a lot in our short time together. You have a really interesting platform as a scholar, an author. You are an entrepreneur. You're an academic, you used to be at Harvard. And reformed academic. Reformed, yeah. correction, <laughs> accepted. People pay you to speak, they pay for your books, they want your ideas. But really it seems like you're a man on a mission to sort of overturn a paradigm. I don't see that on a lot of people's business cards. Tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. It sounds so crazy. Yeah, it's a great pickup line, right? Um, <laughs> paradigm. Look, I think everybody in America knows something's wrong. And it just feels like the wheels just fell off. And, you know, we're looking at, at, at causes, we're pointing at different things. But this idea of a paradigm is just simply the fundamental assumptions and principles that people use to build a society. And it, every so often throughout history, that paradigm starts to crumble a little bit and, and people start to lose faith in it and bad things happen and sometimes good things happen. So one of your big academic ideas, philosophical ideas, observations about society is what you describe as collective illusions. Take a few minutes and unpack that hypothesis for us. Collective illusion is a social phenomenon where most people in a group end up going along with an idea that they don't privately agree with simply because they incorrectly think most everybody else in the group agrees with it. And so as a result, entire groups end up going along with something that almost nobody really wanted. So dumb example, let's say I'm at a, a cafeteria restaurant with a bunch of people, I don't like tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I think that everyone else likes tomatoes. I want to be liked by those other people, so I order tomatoes thinking that they think I would want tomatoes. Yeah, we all know uh, of these small examples in our lives where we were like, wait, why did we all do that, right? Like. But what we've found in our private opinion research is that these collective illusions are no longer rare or isolated or small. And we all get end up veering off paths of, of fulfillment and flourishing, chasing what we think other people think. In an age of social media, this becomes an unmitigated disaster if you're not careful. Consider this, for example, on, well, what was formerly known as Twitter. X, please. X, research done on when it was Twitter that about 80% of all content is generated by only 10% of the users. And it turns out that 10%, they're not remotely representative of the American public. On almost every social issue, they are in the extremes. But you can see the problem here, right? If only 10% of people hold a view, but you think it's 80%, unless you're willing to go against what you think the majority thinks, you are likely to say nothing self-silence, go along to get along. And then pretty soon, the only voice that anyone's hearing is from the fringe, and the result's a collective illusion. So as a child, watching how you speak, hearing the words you're saying, our pattern there, our approach of mimicry actually works. We learn language. And maybe kind of pre-internet days, 
spending time at the Rotary or the VFW and having beers and conversations, that actually was maybe a better set of raw material coming into us to understand. Obviously, it's biased because it's people that you're near, but it's maybe different ages or races or socioeconomic statuses. Also, you know the reputation of the people speaking. There's a little more checks on things. So a real problem you point to with social media is that the content that we are consuming is shaping how we mimic other people. Exactly, and we don't realize that this phenomenon exists. But we've known about it for like 100 years. This isn't new, it's just on steroids now. I want to push on one element, though, of how this shapes my own behavior. Why do we decide to follow the thing even if we know it's not what we want? So there's two things that go into how you end up with a collective loop. And it's not some person behind the curtain manipulating everything. It's just how our brains are wired. All humans, including me, including you, even though I don't like it, we have a conformity bias. Our brains are wired to, like all else equal, we'd prefer to be with our groups, not against our groups. There's a huge advantage to being part of the group. There is. And here's where it gets really interesting. You would think that how important conformity is, your brain would have this super sophisticated way of estimating group consensus, but it doesn't. It's this incredibly simplistic shortcut. Your brain assumes the loudest voices repeated the most are the majority. In America today, somewhere between 50 and 60% of Americans admit to self-silencing. As a country, we are not being honest with each other about what we think. It would be bad enough if we were hiding our views because our groups really did disagree with us. When most of the time, your group actually agreed with you in private. It's an illusion, so your behavior is actually potentially destroying the very group that you're trying to conform to to protect. That's where we're at today. I mean, we have more private opinion data than I think any other organization in America today. And I'm telling you, it is unbelievable. It doesn't matter where we talk about education, politics, the future of the country, the kind of lives we want to live, or even the American dream. The defining feature is collective illusions. Clearly, there are some novel polling data insights here. I want to connect them to these big trends that I really see as kind of continuous. It is, how do we educate our kids? Mm -hmm and how do those kids become adults and go on to find meaning and purpose in their work. Connecting the challenge of the collective illusions to the sort of crisis we have across education and work. So let's start with education. If I could boil it down to one thing, it's that the vast majority of the public, including parents, want different, not just better. They don't want a better mousetrap, right? They want a fundamentally different purpose for education. They want it to be about cultivating their child's unique potential, preparing them to flourish, right? And really make a contribution. And look, they they want them to have a a stable career doing work that they enjoy. This is what most everybody wants. That's not the system we have. And and I don't even mean to be, it was never meant to be the system we have, right? We have a system that was designed to mass educate people, largely as anonymous widgets. I mean, I don't even mean that as derogatory as it sounds. That was the point, right? Treat everyone exactly the same. You go through the same kind of factory system. We'll sort you as best we can. Some of you will go on to college. The the purpose of public education in America today is just college prep. That idea that everyone has to go to college and that's the end all be all has completely plummeted. It's not part of the American dream anymore. It's It's kind of crazy. So here's the problem though. There's a lot of um, unanimity with respect to what people want in terms of the development and flourishing and, and good careers. But when you ask them what they think most people think, they think overwhelmingly most everybody is perfectly happy with the system we have. They, they think that most people prioritize college prep, standardized tests, everybody uh, d- taking the same courses the same way. It's pretty unbelievable. Education is not really a market, not really. Not, not a fully functioning market, as you know. <laughs> North of 80% of American parents have essentially no choice on where they Correct. send their kids to school. So the only kind of change that could happen in that captured system is one that we all agreed to, or we believed we all agreed to, unless you have the money to just opt out. So think about it. If I'm like, I don't really like what's happening to my kid. I really want something else for them, but I think I'm kind of alone in that. If I think everybody else is happy, it's never gonna change it creates a sense of hopelessness that change could happen. I want to pick up one little historical backstory. You loathe Frederick Taylor. (laughs) Yeah, listen, Frederick Taylor is like the worst person you've never heard of. Who was he and what did he, how did he wreck shop? Frederick Taylor is in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. This rise of deep paternalism 
Frederick Taylor is like, hey, listen, this idea of people starting with their own autonomy and choice and building a great society from there is silly. It's just wasteful, it's inefficient. And so he comes up with this idea. He says, look, for anything that, that matters, there's one right way to do it, and there's one right outcome. And he does that in the workforce. This is where he's gonna go after, where he starts to restructure the entire relationship between employees and their employer. Anyone that works in corporate America is living under the shadow of Frederick Taylor. If you're now just cogs that have to be managed, you need an entire group of people who manages those cogs, right? So he does this. And of course, if you're now the management people, this is kind of great. If work is now structured in this standardized, one-size-fits-all way, with those of us that get to make decisions and everyone else does what they're told, not surprising that then what comes next is education into this essentially factory model. It's preparing people for this new economy that he's created. And so when we think about how an institution like education that's so important could get so off course in alignment between the purpose that it serves and the purpose the public wants it to serve, that's how. I want to talk a little bit about what Taylor and that management approach did to business. 100, 120 years ago, these early industrialists, yeah. um, Henry Ford and the early days of Coke and Cargill and Morgan and Mellon, all these um, inventors that thought a lot about process. And it's around, I don't know, plus or minus a decade that there's this long, continuous flat line of GDP mm -hmm. per capita, and then there's just this like meteoric rise. And I, what I'm hearing you say is all that efficiency, we should have had sort of like, you know, Montessori knitting circles instead. Uh, and I'm like, exactly, no. Exactly right. I want everyone to have Montessori knitting schools. Let's unpack that for a okay. second, because I'm glad you're clarifying. Although Montessori knitting schools would be okay. Too. It would be cool. Um, it would be cool. Here's the thing. It is certainly true, and I'll be the first to say, that robbing people of control over their lives absolutely can increase material gains, for sure. And in some areas like education, the birth of like the high school movement, which is the biggest mass education in the history of the world that we did, you were never gonna get that through a bespoke model, right? You were either gonna give everybody the same thing or you're gonna get some kids that got a good education and other kids got nothing. What I'm saying is that the gains that we've made through efficiency alone are not worth the trade-off on the psychological side and that we didn't need to make those trade-offs. I, I don't think it's remotely controversial to say the point of life was not material gain alone. The point of life was joy, flourishing, happiness, whatever you want to call it, leading a good life. But when I, from the day that I enter a school system to the last day I get my gold watch for working at a place, have almost no say in the life I'm living, it's not terribly surprising that it's incredibly difficult to increase genuine life satisfaction. Mm. And people are wildly different in terms of the things that they value. You have described COVID as having uh, an effect on work, maybe at the same level as Taylor did. Mm -hmm. Fill us in on what you've seen in the last few years around COVID and particularly speaking to entrepreneurs and business owners who are trying to create cultures that we think will drive human flourishing. What have you seen? So a couple of things, and this wasn't rocket science. Every single public shock to a system, war, famine, you know, plagues, has always done a number of things to society. So I think a couple of things have happened with COVID that affects work in a profound way. Number one, when you look at trade-off priorities for the work you do, there's still like things like pay and benefits still matter to people a lot. I would have been super skeptical if suddenly it's like, we don't care what we get paid. Yes, you do. But now in the top three consistently, there's this new idea of flexibility in how I do my job. And it doesn't just mean remote work. There's a little more nuance there in the ability to have some flexibility about how I do my work. But the other thing that is just really remarkable is the complete plummeting in almost everything that has to do with prestige. We think everybody cares about this. The job title, the company is really prestigious, you know, all the stuff is basically Silicon Valley. Uh, a lot of the swag, all the free meals and stuff like that, it's just in private, it's like, I don't care. What do I get out of doing the work itself? What's risen up consistently, and it's one of those things that spans demographics, which was surprising, is they want to do work that is meaningful to them. This meaning dimension is, is here to stay. Second, they want to be trusted in how they do their work. Like, okay, they want meaning and they want to be trusted. 
you, you pair that with the broader zeitgeist of we're kind of done being told what to do, and you're seeing a, a craving for something that this is where I'll come back to Frederick Taylor. Whatever we got for treating people as widgets, which we did get something, it took this other part of our lives where we want purpose and meaning and fulfillment. We want to really flourish and made it a devil's bargain where work's not going to give you any of that, but then you can go find that afterwards with the extra money you have. I don't think people right now want work to be the end all be all. They don't need work to be the thing that gives them purpose, but they are starting to expect that work play a positive role in the broader lives that they want to live. I want to talk a little bit about your findings on how our attitudes towards work are changing. For the most part, labor markets are fluid. You can choose and have some portability about where you work. And when I look at how what has happened across entrepreneurship in this heavy capitalist market, there do not seem to be that many companies that, through how they manage, are in alignment with your observation. Oh, uh, no. And, and if you think about it, this has been the trend for 100 years almost. It's very hard, especially with big behemoth companies, to turn those things around when they are literally organized around a paradigm that is built on scientific management principles. Very hard. Because we've been in this paradigm for so long, even when we don't like it, we're like, it sort of has to be some version of this. Let's take, uh, and I'm sure you know, but like Morningstar tomato. They grow tomatoes, it's heavy in California. Yeah, it's uh, basically like the top supplier of like tomato paste products or whatever it is. So into this industrial thing, there are no managers. They have built an entire industrial thing. Now they are killing it. 800 million in revenue. Yeah, it seems crazy, right? Like even for me, which I love this stuff, I'm like, no, come on. How is that? How does that not just become like a disaster, right? But what you see is not only have they been incredibly efficient in winning at that game, they're beating any Taylorist organization. Let's take a break from our conversation to go to Los Bonos, California, to get a closer look at this no boss model at a Morningstar facility. So Liberty Factory is actually probably our most complex factory at Morningstar because we do so many different things here. This is James, an operator at the facility. Our season is from the beginning of July through the beginning of November. Because we visited in the off season, actual tomatoes were kind of hard to find, but normally it looks more like this. Producing 5 million tons of tomatoes each year, you'd expect Morningstar to have a conventional, top-down, hierarchical system of management. But they call their no-boss approach mission-focused self-management. Employees choose their mission, and that defines their daily tasks. So what's going on what's, here is they got the skills training. So it's like a progression, like they basically have... This is Tara. Her mission is to ensure that the self-management culture is thriving at Morningstar. Most of my days spend interacting with colleagues. So when you think about mission-focused self-management, it's built on agreements, and the structure is human relationships. But we wanted to know how this model actually functions between colleagues. Workers create a colleague letter of understanding, or CLUE. This is basically like a job description. It lists out the daily tasks for which you are responsible, and the colleagues who depend on your commitments. Tomatoes keep going down the line, sort out tomatoes that have maybe some green on them. Pinch beds actually remove the skins from the tomatoes before they're diced. James' mission involves administering the facility's production. It includes knowing a lot about tomatoes, and I mean a lot. As you're evaporating the water out of the tomatoes, ending up at about 31%. About 15% of every kibble recipe of, as far as uh, dog food is tomato pumice. Of course, diced tomatoes can be used for all types of different products, you know, salsas and soups and all kinds of different things. It's amazing. We have a couple different feedback mechanisms, but a lot of where I really find out where the needs are is just talking to colleagues. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Meeting with them through the SMI mini sessions. We talk a lot, which we're going to get into, is collaboration, right? Getting others involved and about holding accountability because you don't have a person over you saying, okay, here's your checklist. These meetings occur monthly to talk about challenges, conflict resolution tactics, and improvement areas. And that means ownership of accountability, whether even if you, you aren't the one making the commitment, you take ownership and hold the other person accountable for yes. that commitment. So to your point, Leo, I'm also responsible. So it's all of us together. Yeah, okay, so, so what were you saying about that pump over there, Jesse? Leo works in the electrical and evaporation units, and he's also a self-management ambassador, 
meaning he acts as a resource to his colleagues when they have self-management issues. We don't have a human boss, but the closest thing that we do have to a boss is our mission. My mission statement is to promote an environment where human and electrical energy can reach their full capabilities. You get to really stand on your work ethic and your accomplishments here. There's no hard lines. Everyone also has the ability to question others to say, hey, why is this happening this way? So there's a lot of ownership and opportunity to grow into new areas of responsibility or expertise. Conflicts are mediated. If they can't come to agreement, having a third person come and help mediate usually helps resolve the issue. Morningstar says it relies on ownership, collaboration, efficiency, and integrity to succeed. But still, the company's model is pretty far from a traditional workplace structure. When you talk about mission-focused self-management and people say that it doesn't work, I truly believe it's because they don't understand it. The creativity that comes out of this kind of system compared to a system where you're boxed in, it pushes you to be uncomfortable to the point to where you really become really great at what you're trying to accomplish. What do you think is important for us to leave here with today? Some feedback that I always get from colleagues is that they like the fact that they can also take it outside of work. I think I'm a better communicator now, especially in my, my personal life after starting working here. I believe that if you give them the ability to kind of come up with their ideas, to pursue their dreams, pursue their goals, to flourish, you're gonna do things here you're never gonna be able to do anywhere else. It's interesting to think about how so many innovative ideas could be unlocked through more self-management-based companies while giving employees more fulfillment and meaning and the impacts that that could have on the future of work. Let's return now to our conversation with Todd. Obviously, Morningstar is performing incredibly well economically. What do we know about the happiness or satisfaction or flourishing of their employees? And what do we even mean by some of those terms? First of all, Morningstar, they, they have this self-management institute that studies all this. I know from the, the data that I've seen that they pretty consistently have higher levels of satisfaction at work, uh, purpose, happiness. I think the bigger picture here is there's this sort of non-economic aspect of the lives we want to live. And we all kind of know we want to live a good life. And whether you call that flourishing, you know, purpose, fulfillment, whatever, I believe most everyone's kind of in the same ballpark. And let's just call it flourishing. We do understand a number of things that drive that, and then that will have implications for work. Now, do I think everything needs to be morning star tomato? No. Like, uh, but you can back that off and realize there are dozens and dozens of variations of this where you start by assuming humans have dignity and that you don't have to control every aspect of their life to get productivity, efficiency, and innovation. So from my perspective, the biggest mistake we make in the flourishing space is we keep falling for this idea of objective value. People are unbelievably individual in what they prioritize and the kind of value they get from the exact same experience, okay? So any talk about flourishing has to start with the fact that we are unique individuals. At the core of all research that I've looked at that, that really drives a lot of flourishing is this idea of autonomy, which is a fancy way of saying people believe they have some control over their own life. Mm. When you look at the top 10 priorities in aggregate for the American public, for what they mean by a good life, the number one thing that people care about more than anything is doing work that has a positive effect on other people. The fifth highest priority is being engaged in your community. And we also ask people how they're doing on all these attributes. How are they achieving it right now? In the top 10 most important attributes, again, engage in your community is number five. It has the lowest level of achievement of any of the top 10. Hmm. More people in America today say they are debt free than engaged in their community, even though they care about both. But the demand is there, they yeah. just, what's going on? So, so a couple of things. One we know for sure, and one we got, got to understand more. Massive collective illusion. We actually don't think anyone cares about engaging. It's a bottom dwelling. We perceive it to be a bottom dwelling priority for most everybody else. Hmm. But here's, I think, the bigger one, and we don't have an answer yet, but we have to figure this out, is there's clearly some set of obstacles to getting engaged in my community, and we don't know what those really are. No, or I don't know, maybe somebody does, but we're gonna figure that out. So there's things we can do, but it, it really comes back to at the end of the day, appreciating that we right now live in a society in which we are spectacularly wrong about what most people think. And 
The reason this is so critical is if you woke up today and thought, most people, including other people in the other political party, actually hold my same values, think about what that would do to the way you think about them and treat them. It's when we start to see them as so fringy and so out of touch with like, wow, this isn't even decent, that we actually start to see them as truly other. Find these subtle ways to be honest with each other, you'll have more of an effect than you possibly imagine on society. Let me put a contrast to you. I've observed from afar large consulting firms, Deloitte and Accenture, working to recruit sort of top kids out of uh, undergrads, which some would argue have basically become um, activist training camps where many undergrads see their civic life, their political groups, their fight for justice is kind of why they're in school. Yeah. And they carry that mentality. So the affinity groups, the marches, the protests at places like that, and some conversations they've said, CEO of the said, I don't really believe in that stuff. We are in a all out war for talent. It's what these kids want, so we give it to them. In great contrast though, Brian Armstrong Coinbase mm -hmm. says, we're not a family, we're a team. We don't do politics here, not because I'm conservative and you're liberal, but we don't do politics because that is not our mission. Right. And uh, those are pretty different ends of the spectrum. How does your research speak to either one That's of those great. positions? That's great. So <clears throat> two, two pieces of data that we've got in this space that, that converge. One, within the workforce priorities index, like what do people want? People do not want their CEOs taking stances on social issues. It's just not important to them, but they think other people do, right? Now, here's what's interesting about that. There's two groups of people in America that are, in my mind, the most susceptible to collective illusions. The first is politicians. The other one is CEOs. You're obsessed about meeting market need. You're obsessed with the war for talent. You've got to get the best people. But you also don't realize that the people you're hearing from all the time are not the majority. They're often just a very vocal fringe. The second piece of data to this point, we have uh, a different methodology that we use. We didn't invent, but um, it's like a truth serum kind of methodology for when people are flat out lying because they really can't tell the truth. We deployed that about, uh, about 18 months ago or so on all these super sensitive cultural issues. Everything from things like parents having more say in schools to transgender stuff in college sports to like workforce issues like CEOs. Nobody upon nobody, no demographic in the country, in private, has even 25% of their group wanting CEOs to take public stands on controversial issues. Nobody wants this. You show them the data, you show them how you get it. You're like, this is legit, look at this, right? And then you show them and they're like, do you promise? Like, like this is like the greatest thing. I, I don't want us to be doing this, but I feel like I have to. I'm like, but imagine that you thought you had to, to recruit talent or win market share. And it's actually the opposite. You're misreading your own customers and your own employees. To me, the future is this, which is, it's more like Coinbase. It's, listen, it's not because these things don't matter, politics don't matter, it's that that's not the reason we're all here. Mm. And you can have your views. We, I don't need you to have, as soon as, as the CEO takes a stand, that, that purports to represent everybody in that organization. Right? You're, you're never gonna win. Um, I think you saw the collective illusion at play there with Netflix. Bending over backwards, bending over backwards, and then finally it's like, look, <laughs> we're like bleeding customers. Give kind of a call to action to entrepreneurs that are listening. Where might you invite entrepreneurial approaches or solutions to some of the things we've discussed? Maybe not surprisingly, like, to me, I think entrepreneurship is the actual solution. You know, even way back when, when you had these debates about capitalism and communism and Marx, Marx just completely neglected the very idea of an entrepreneur, right? It's just this, this amorphous, capitalist, centralized state, like it's just behemoth, and then there's like the people, right? Like what he didn't realize is entrepreneurs by definition are constantly trying to overturn the apple cart, right? Constantly questioning the aim or how we get there, right? They're the lifeblood of a free market and a free society. And I, I would say a couple of things about this, especially in these paradigm shifts, the crisis we're in, where it's not that we want a better mousetrap. Like the very purpose of our society is up for grabs. Everything is on the table now. Old solutions don't work and we don't necessarily even want them, but we don't necessarily know what good looks like and we don't know what to choose. So into that breach, who else is there but entrepreneurs? 
in my view, not only do you need more of those in the free market, right, the actual economy, we have to take that same mentality into the social sector. It's not just private solutions, it's the entrepreneurial mindset about how we solve problems that needs to be moved over into this, right? So when I think about people who operate in nonprofit space, and there's almost like this charity mindset, this I'm doing good for you, I'm gonna tell you, like, you're a social entrepreneur. You gotta think like that and you gotta act like that. And the reason that's important, and I think one of the biggest problems, we've got some work on this that I'm really excited about, is in, in, the, in the social sector, we often are focused on problems, not the human beings behind those problems. Mm. But if I'm an entrepreneur, I am obsessed about the individuals whose need I'm trying to meet, and it doesn't matter what I want them to want or need. All that matters is that I am creating solutions that truly meet their needs and their desires. I believe that we will solve some of life's biggest challenges, not just again economically, but on the social side, if we take that same mentality. You have way more control over your life than you think, and the ability to exercise that, the ability to say, look, what does it mean to take responsibility for my life? What does it mean? It means I've got to know kind of what I care about. It means I got to understand my choices. It means I got to take feedback. I got to learn from those mistakes, right? A lot of us don't have that habit anymore. I think that, that weirdly enough, from my perspective, obsessing about what it means to truly flourish, obsessing about that concept of autonomy and that, that sense of self-determination, a lot of other stuff takes care of itself. Mm. It really does, right? Because if you care about it, you're gonna do the due diligence. If all you care about is what other people think, you're not. Mm. So get focused on what it means to live your own life. Realize that this age of being told what to do and being controlled is ending. And think about the kind of life you wanna live and the kind of contribution you wanna make. And I, I'm telling you, the rest takes care of itself. Well, from this, I'm a little bit alarmed that I probably believe a lot of lies. So I have some homework to do. On Especially that. half of them I've told today. This is great. But I am I am really excited by this possible collapse in the paradigm that we're in right now, that a number of the uh, social ills that we see in our society may relate to how we think about each other, the complete erosion of trust. And into that space is proper learning, which we explored a lot today. And your books are amazing and highly encourage people to dive into that space. But also when we take those insights and observations about what is true and bring them into society through entrepreneurship, it's so exciting because it's not hoping what people want, it's ruthlessly given feedback by the market. You're meeting people in their full dignity and saying, what do you want? How can I serve you? And then when the capital comes around it and the team, it means this is not a solution for one, but it's a solution for the whole nation. So That's if right. we take your ideas and some entrepreneurial energy, I think we can wreck shop for some really important things. But yeah. this was a ton of fun. Really appreciate all your work you've done on this and your time today. Thank you.